Hey, good evening. Glad you could join us for tonight's service. We are here uh, online only. We've had a bit of a, an outbreak in the church with the coronavirus, so we felt uh, just to try to limit some of the services, and so that's why we're online only here tonight, and we hope that uh, you are safe and feeling well, and especially be praying for those that are haven't been feeling well because of the, the coronavirus. We do want to uh, continue with our study out of uh, the New Testament, and we've been looking at New Testament disciples. These are the people that follow Jesus. We looked at some of the apostles that um, there's information about them. There were a number of apostles. Really, we don't know anything about other than their name. And uh, now we're kind of uh, going out, branching out to some of the other people that followed Jesus, but weren't one of the original 12 apostles, but they were still disciples. They were still followers of Jesus. So we looked at uh, people such as Mary Magdalene. We looked at uh, Mary and Martha last week. These are people that follow Jesus, but certainly we're not called to be a specific apostle. Well, tonight we're going to look at uh, another person that was not an apostle, but probably was what we would call uh, one of the first deacons. He was definitely an evangelist, definitely a preacher, but he was called, first off, to uh, the ministry of helping so let's look at the story of Stephen tonight. Stephen is going to be the first disciple to die uh, for their faith. There'd be many others that would die, but Stephen was the very first one that would die for his faith. So we look at um, Acts chapter 6 tonight, and we read, In those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily uh, ministration. Now let's pray first and ask the Lord to bless. Father, thank you tonight for this time to share the word. I pray that it would help us to understand these early disciples, these people that are willing to lay their life on the line for the cause of Jesus. Help us to be inspired by their stories and help us, Lord, to live for you and be willing, Lord, to give our lives for you likewise, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just to give you a little bit of a background as we look at Acts chapter 6 tonight. In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon the church. 120 people were in an upper room that day in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and uh, they began now to preach the Word of God with power and boldness. Peter uh, address a bunch of uh, Jewish worshipers that day on Pentecost and preached the message of Christ. 3,000 people were saved. Shortly thereafter, the number jumps to 5,000 people, and we see that the church is started. And as the church is now started, there is, uh, of course, uh, a blessing, but there's problems. The more people you have, the more problems you have. Uh, when the ministry was small, and there were only 12 apostles, and people were getting saved, but there was no church, there was no collective body, um, you know, the, uh, there was not a pastor, there was not deacons, there was no church the way we know church today until after Pentecost. And, and now we see a new dynamics. We see the church started. We see now the need for people to serve in the church. The apostles were the early pastors, if you will. They taught the people, they instructed, they were the voice that Jesus left behind to help people to understand his parables and his teachings and the Apostles' Doctrine, the Apostles' Creed is what really the early church was based upon before they, uh, the New Testament was written. Well, as uh, the church is now expanding, uh, several things were happening in Jerusalem. Well, one of the problems uh, in Jerusalem was that there was a famine, and uh, because of this famine, there were many people that had come and worshipped and uh, became Christians, and they wanted to stay there in Jerusalem and kind of wanted to be a part of this new wave of of, uh, of believer, believers, and what happens now is you have a bunch of people there, and uh, some, as we mentioned, coming to the city and not really having jobs, and add to that a famine, and, and what happens is you have a lot of people that don't have food and uh, are in need, and so as Christians, they began to band together and take care of one another, and uh, what they would do is they would uh, collect up money and and give it to the apostles, and apostles would then spread it out amongst the, the people and the widows in, in particular, since they had no opportunity probably to get jobs and they, they had needs. And uh, so the, the, the apostles became overloaded, overloaded with preaching the gospel and, and ministering the word, 
and then ministering food and supplies of the people. So it got too much. They, they, they just, you know, started to, to realize that we need to do things differently here. Once again, everything was brand new. The church was brand new. People were getting saved. There's no protocol, really, for churches up to this point. And so as uh, this problem arises, it, it caused some murmuring. In verse number one, we saw that uh, there were uh, there was a great multitude of people, and there arose a murmuring or complaining among the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Now, here's what was happening. There were two groups of people in Christianity. Realize um, that at this point, the the most the, the predominantly the church is made up of Jewish believers. The the you know the gospel had not been preached yet to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles, and so this was you know primarily a Jewish ministry as uh, the gospel went to the Jew first. Well, what happens is that there are two groups of Jews there. There's the the Grecians and the Hebrews. The the word Grecians there really means a uh, Hellenists. Now, Hellenist was somebody who was uh, culturally connected to the Greek. Remember, before the Romans, it was the Greek Empire. Uh, Greek was a, a, a language that was spoken there uh, amongst a, a number of people. There were cultures and customs from the, from the Greeks, even though the Romans were in charge at that time. And so even amongst the Jews, you had uh, sort of these two classification of Jews. You had the strict Hebrews. And then you had those Jews that were called Hellenistic because they followed Greek culture, probably spoke the language. And so now there was kind of a little bit of a divide between even the, the people in Judaism. And so the, uh, the Grecians felt that uh, we're not being treated equally as our brethren, the, the strict Hebrews, because our widows are being neglected. So, uh, you know, you kind of read between the lines, you see that there was maybe some, some friction there and maybe thinking that there was some prejudice because they were not uh, strict Jews, just like today there's different classifications of Jews from uh, Orthodox to Reformed. There's you know, a number of different classifications, and so it was in that day also. As their complaining went on, the apostles realized that they needed to figure something out. There were 12 apostles, and how do you take care of all these people and all these widows and all the needs of the people, there might have been hundreds and thousands of people that needed to be fed. So how do you, how do you take care of that? Well, you can't. Uh, and, and so what do you do? Well, you decide to, uh, to get help. And so verse number two, then the twelve called unto the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look out ye among you seven men, of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So the apostles had to make a decision. What is the most important thing we need to do? And they felt, and, and rightly so, that the most valuable use of their time was to teach and preach the Word and to pray. And if they were so busy passing out food that they would now neglect the spiritual side of of the ministry, which is the, you know, the, the preaching and teaching of, of God's Word. And so they said, let's look out and let's get some people that will help us. We'll continue to preach. We'll continue to minister the Word and pray. But we'll find other people that can actually distribute the food and take care of the physical needs of the people while we take care of the spiritual needs of the people. And so they asked them to look out and find some good men that would be in charge of the food distribution. Now this is really where the ministry of the deacon comes from, as uh, the word ministration in verse 1 in the Greek is uh, a, a word that uh, really comes, uh, which we get the word deacon from. And uh, in essence, find us some men, find us some deacons, some helpers, people that can take care of the physical needs of the people. So they look out and they choose now uh, seven men, and uh, these men's names are mentioned here in verse number 5. And, and the saying uh, pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man of full, full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and uh, Nicanor, and Timon, and Parnemons, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. 
Now, some people believe that Stephen may have been of the Hellenistic group. We're not really sure, but maybe it makes sense that they would choose some men from the strict Hebrews and the strict Hellenist, and kind of there would be kind of a balance there, and uh, hopefully you know, both groups could have their needs met. And so the uh, situation seemed like that that would be the answer to the problem. So let's look at the life of Stephen. So first off, uh, first point we want to give you tonight is Stephen is selected. Out of all the people that could have been chosen to be in charge of distributing the you know, the food and the money and things of that nature. Uh, it was Stephen that was one of the seven that was chosen. And now where the apostles were chosen by Jesus, and of course the last apostle, Judas, uh, or the, betray, the betrayer, we looked at him last week as uh, he hung himself. Matthias took his place. So he actually was kind of chosen by the apostles as they, they drew uh, uh, lots to figure out who the next one would be. But now they are going to uh, anoint and ordain men that will be the ministry of, of the deacon. And so these are not prominent men. These are not prestigious men. These are not men with maybe great financial wealth. But what these men were is they were spiritual men. Notice uh, some of the things that these men had to have. Uh, first off, they had to be of honest report. That means they had a good testimony. They were trusted. There was no bad testimony about them. There was no questionable character about them. They were good men. The people could, could look at them and trust them. They were of honest report. Another thing, they were full of the Holy Ghost. Now, they all had been filled with the Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost, but some displayed maybe the filling of the Holy Spirit with their, uh, their ministry and their boldness and their teaching the Word of God and evangelizing. And so they were uh, evident that a man was filled with the Holy Ghost. Another thing is they were full of wisdom. Wisdom. They were not foolish men. These were not... Uh, men that uh, had questionable ideas and questionable decision-making processes. These men were godly men that were full of wisdom. And isn't that a great combination for a deacon? And, you know, in, in the local churches, these are things that we look for, for men that are going to serve in the ministry, uh, under the pastor, under the leadership of the pastor, people of honest report, people of uh, filled with the Spirit of God, people full of wisdom. In fact, when we get to First Timothy... When Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, here's what the pastor's requirements are, and now here is what the deacon's requirements are. And that's found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 through 13. So the qualifications of the deacons now became official when uh, Paul addressed Timothy. And so these men were full of faith. Now, Paul, uh, now it says here that Stephen was a man that was full of faith and the Holy Ghost. A man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. So he was chosen because of his character. He was chosen because of his spirituality. He was chosen because he displayed all the necessary qualities and characteristics of a man that could be entrusted with money and entrusted with food and entrusted with making decisions. And so these seven men now would become, a uh, uh, once again, a, a, a group that was responsible for all the needs of maybe thousands of people and making sure that everybody got their food and everybody got what they needed as uh, the church really was helping one another out. And so we see Stephen's selection. Now let's see the second aspect of Stephen's life, and we're going to see Stephen's service. Stephen's service. Verse number 8 says this, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So not only were these men equipped to handle the distribution, but they also, and, and Stephen in particular, wa, uh, was gifted in being able to uh, perform miracles. So like the apostles could perform miracles and wonders, and so maybe this was God's stamp of approval, showing that, yes, these men are called, these men will be used, and these men will truly be, uh, you know, follow kind of right behind the apostles in having the ability to do signs and wonders. So imagine Stephen performing miracles, and, and, and so the people could trust him. They knew that he was a man of God. They knew that he had come from God. Well, you know, whenever God is doing something, the devil now has to try to stop it. And just as uh, the devil tried to use the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin uh, to oppose Jesus, now you have 
some opposition to this ministry of the deacons. And Stephen in particular uh, is now expands his ministry as he, he begins to, to teach and to preach in the synagogues in the area. Now notice the opposition arises. Verse number 9, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which were called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. So there were pockets of people. Libertarians means these were freed slaves, and uh, some of these people from other areas, from Cyrene, from Alexandria, which is in Egypt, uh, you know, uh, Cilicia, which was in, in Asia Minor. And uh, in essence, these different synagogues would have people groups that would gather together from certain nationalities in certain regions as he was preaching in these particular uh, synagogues, uh, people didn't like what he had to say. These were strict Jews. They didn't want to hear about Jesus. They didn't want to hear that he's Messiah. They would crucified Jesus. They looked at him upon, as, as a fake and a phony. And they were just simply echoing what the uh, head Pharisees and Sadducees had taught them and told them. They had not witnessed probably the ministry of Jesus personally, or they may have had a different uh, opinion, a different belief. But now they began to oppose him. They're disputing what he's saying. But once again, here's a man that's full of faith and power and great wonders. And, and uh, verse uh, number 10 says, And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. They became frustrated because everything that they spoke against Jesus and against Christianity, uh, Stephen refuted with Scripture and in power the Spirit of God. And so they they realize that, that we're up against somebody that we can't debate, we can't persuade, we can't change in people's minds. This man is too persuasive, he's too powerful in what he's saying, because he's filled with the Spirit of God, and God is using him. And so, as was the case when they arrested Jesus, they found false witnesses. And in verse 11 it says, Then they suburn, or, or they, they bought off and paid off men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Isn't that wicked? Isn't that terrible? You had to pay somebody. Now, these are men who are supposed to be spiritual. They're in the synagogue. These are not secular men. These are men that are supposedly worship, worshiping in the synagogue, and they can't refute what Stephen is saying. And so they hire men to come and tell a lie that Stephen has blasphemed Moses and God. Well, you know, you don't blaspheme Moses, you don't blaspheme God. It's kind of like when King Ahab wanted to get Naboth's field. And he, uh, you know, Jezebel came up with that idea of accusing uh, Naboth of blaspheming Moses and blaspheming God, and he was stoned to death. And so this is really the same, same situation, just, you know, thousands of years later. And so what happens is that these men now come, they lie, and they... Uh, are now spreading, uh, once again, that uh, he is a blasphemer. And, you know, the strict Pharisees, the, you know, boy, if you blaspheme, what's going to happen? You, you need to die. And uh, certainly if he was a blasphemer, that would have been part of the law. But even uh, they could not take the law in their own hands because they were under Roman rule. And even when they went to execute Jesus, the Jewish leaders could not execute Jesus because... They were under Roman rule. That's why they had to go to Pontius Pilate and persuade him. And Pontius Pilate didn't even believe what they were saying, didn't even believe that Jesus was a threat. But he just went along with them to kind of keep peace. And uh, so he ordered the execution of Jesus. But in this particular case, these people now uh, are not even going to go to the Roman government. They're going to take matters in their own hands. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> as you see in verse 12, and they stirred up the people... And the elders and the scribes came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. And we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs of which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Wow, what a, what a testimony for Stephen. They're accusing him, accusing him, and they're saying he is, 
you know, preaching Jesus, and he is saying that Jesus is going to destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. And while they're saying all this, his, his face looked like an angel. Now, I'm not sure what an angel looks like, but I'm sure it was very peaceful, very holy, very special, as he was given the grace of God to sit through all this, this wicked accusation against him. Now, did Jesus ever say he was going to destroy this place? No. What he did say at one time, he said, if you destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. And that's what was you know, brought before uh, Pontius Pilate and, uh, and the, the Jewish leader said, oh, he said that he was going to destroy the temple and raise it back up. But he wasn't talking about the physical temple that was there in Jerusalem. He was talking about his body as the temple. And he said, if you kill this body, which they did, in three days he'd raise it up, which he did. And so Jesus' uh, prophecy came to pass. But once again, they twisted his words. They twisted this prophecy. And they now said, well, he's proclaiming that Jesus is going to destroy this place and going to change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Did, did Jesus change the customs? Well, yeah, in essence, he did. Because now you're no longer under the law when you're under grace. You no longer have to sacrifice anymore. That was part of the law because Jesus is the final sacrifice. You no longer had a need of a priesthood because now we the believers become the priesthood and Jesus is the high priest. We no longer have to worship in a, in a particular temple because now God says that wherever the Spirit of God is, is you can worship God in spirit and truth. And uh, so that aspect, yes, Jesus did change the customs of Moses. That's not to say that we disregard the law completely. It just means that he completed the law. And now grace comes in, and now we are no longer under that aspect uh, of the law. Well, so uh, as uh, he is now being arrested, and uh, he is just, uh, you know, once again, a, a, a defender of the faith. Now, let's look at the third aspect of Stephen's life. Let's look at his sermon, Stephen's sermon. Now, Stephen preaches the longest sermon in the book of Acts. It's found in uh, chapter number 7 here. And uh, it is, uh, well, it's from verse 2 through uh, verse uh, 53. So uh, we're not going to read the entire sermon tonight, but you can read it and study it on your own. But I want to pick out some of the highlights of this sermon. And uh, so verse number one of chapter seven says, then said the high priest, are these things so? And he starts off by saying, he said, men, brethren, fathers, hearken, the God, the glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Now, so he, he begins his sermon with a history, a history lesson. He starts with Abraham. Why does he start with Abraham? Because Abraham is the father of the Jews. And he is now explaining how that God called Abraham, their father, out of the Ur of the Chaldees to look for a land, gave him a covenant, and he gave him a promise that his seed would dwell in this land and that uh, God would then give him a great nation. And, and so uh, God did give him, he, as he talks about, he begat Isaac, and uh, then Isaac began, begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. And so he is now identifying how God established Israel. He's speaking to Israelis, Israelites. He's telling them, this is our history. We all come from Abraham. We come from his 12 sons. We all are, are one of the tribes of the 12 uh, children that came from Jacob. And now he begins and explains of the 12 brethren, one of them was persecuted. The one who was persecuted was the righteous one, Joseph. Joseph was hated by his brothers. And he explains that in verse number nine, and the patriarch moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. You see what, he, what he's doing? He's laying the foundation for a rebellion. He's laying the foundation how, how that the Jews have always rejected the righteous people. Joseph was righteous. He's the one that received the promise, the dream that someday he would be in charge of a great nation. And he would be. He would be in charge of Egypt someday. That his family would bow before him. And they did. They were all subjected to him as he was a prime minister later on in Egypt. But they were moved with envy. So what did they do? They tried to kill him at first. And then when they changed their plans on that, they sold him to the Midianites. He said, look, here's what our forefathers did. Our forefathers were corrupt. The brothers 
of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, 10 of them were corrupt men, and they tried to get rid of the righteous one. And so he begins to unfold the story. And he tells Joseph's story. And then he next tells the story of Moses. And he talks about how the children of Israel were in bondage now in Egypt. They cried out to God, and so God sent them a deliverer. Well, the first time that Moses shows his loyalty to the Israelites is whenever he saw some Israelites being beaten unjustly. And so Moses went out, and not that it was the right thing to do, but he, he killed an Egyptian. Well, the next day, his own brethren came back to him, and they said, Who hath made you ruler and judge over us? When Moses heard that, he fled to the backside of the wilderness. And for 40 years, he, he's a shepherd. He's no longer in the court of Pharaoh. And at the age of 80, after 40 years of being in the wilderness, God calls him to lead the children of Israel out of bondage. And so he is equipped with miracles and... Um, and so they uh, escape the Egyptians. While they're escaping the Egyptians, constantly the Israelites are questioning Moses, questioning his leadership. And uh, finally, uh, they make it across. And uh, while Moses is up on Mount Sinai receiving the commandments of God, the Israelites under Aaron are making a golden calf. Look at verse number 40. It says, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto their idol, unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship in a host of the heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness. Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Molech, the star of your god Rephraim, figures which, um, which you made to worship them, and I shall carry you away beyond Babylon. What's the prophecy? Rebellion. The Israelites rebelled. They rebelled against Moses. They rebelled against his leadership. They convinced Aaron to build this golden calf to worship that. The history of Israel has been one of rejecting God and his prophets and his message. And all Stephen is doing is he is giving them a history lesson. This is our forefathers. This is what our nation is all about. We've constantly rejected, constantly uh, gone against God. We've questioned Moses. We didn't want him to be leaders. We uh, followed false gods. And as he went on, he talked about how that God raised up David. And then Solomon built a great house. And uh, what's he doing? He's showing the people that how much God has blessed us. And over and over again, we have rejected God. We've rejected his prophets. Now notice verse 51, he gives a conclusion to this sermon by saying this, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. This is a pretty uh, tough message he gives the people. He calls them stiff-necked, meaning that they, they were not willing to follow God. They would kind of bristle against God's will. He said that you're uncircumcised in heart, meaning that you act like the Gentiles. You act like you're, you're not even believers. And then he says, uh, you are always resisting the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is wooing you to Jesus, and you're resisting him. And so he asks a question in verse 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now betrayers and murderers. Once again, an indictment against Israel is this. Every person that God sent you, you persecuted them. You look down through the history and you see how Jeremiah was persecuted, Isaiah was persecuted. Elijah was persecuted. Elisha was persecuted. On and on. You can look at all these prophets that God gave them, and somewhere in their story you'll see that they received persecution for simply preaching the Word of God. 
And so he said, you are just like your fathers. Now Jesus comes, Messiah comes, and just like your forefathers rejected him, you rejected Messiah likewise. And he called them betrayers and murderers. Betrayers and murderers. They've murdered um, the prophets and they've murdered the very Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 53, Who have received the law and by the disposition of angels have not kept it. What a blessing Israel was giving and they rejected it. What a blessing it was to have the Messiah come through their nation and yet they reject the Messiah. And as he got up that day, as he preached a scathing message, a reminder of the history of the Israelites, instead of repentance, instead of them saying, you know, what you're saying makes sense. We have rejected the prophets, starting with Joseph uh, through Moses and and all throughout our history. They were stiff-necked, just like Stephen said. They resisted the Holy Spirit, just like Stephen said. And to show that they were not men of, of, of any sort of spiritual mindset. Verse 54, we see the last and sad ending of Stephen. We see Stephen stoning. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. The word gnashed on him actually is gnashed at him, meaning that they, they kind of bared their teeth out. Oh, you know, they were so mad at what he was saying. They didn't want to hear it anymore. They were so upset that he called them out. And he compared them to their forefathers. Everything he said was true. And instead of repenting, now they're going to turn to violence. And just like they got rid of Jesus, now let's get rid of one of his disciples. And so verse 55, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Wow, what what a beautiful vision right before you die. He looks up into heaven, he sees Jesus standing. Now we know the Word of God tells us that Jesus sits at the right hand, but this day he stood at the right hand of the Father. Why is he standing? Because he's about ready to receive one of his children to come back home. And as uh, he saw Jesus stand at the right hand, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. They're close. They're We don't want to hear it anymore. They close their ears and stop this blasphemy. You can't see God. You can't see Jesus in heaven. And so they cried out and they ran to him. And they dragged him out of the city. Verse 58, and they cast him out of the city. Why did they have to cast him out of the city? Because they are going to execute him. And it was against the law to execute somebody within the city limits of Jerusalem. Just like Jesus was, was taken outside of the city, outside the camp. That's where Jesus was crucified outside the city of Jerusalem, and so they too took him out. And the Bible says they stoned him in verse 58. And the witness laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And so there were some witnesses there, and there was a young man by the name of Saul who watched the very first martyr die that day. Now, I don't know if uh, you understand the 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 tragedy of, of being stoned to death and to realize uh, how Stephen died. It was a, a painful, excruciating death as people are casting these stones upon him and he's knocked, I guess, unconscious and then eventually enough stones crush him to the point in which he dies. But a young man is sitting there or, or standing there and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, they lay down their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and, and, and uh, uh, he called upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. When he said this, he fell asleep. He died. Just like Jesus on the cross, when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen also was a man of forgiveness. And in his dying moments, the last breath that he took, He asked that these men who had stoned him, that they would be forgiven. Well, one of those men we know would be forgiven, Saul of Tarsus. We're introduced now to another man at that point in his life was against Christianity that approved of the stoning of the first martyr. And that that man, Saul, his life, I believe, would be changed that day as he watched somebody die for the faith. 
when we get to Saul's life, we're going to see that I believe Jesus is going to refer to this time here as a time in which the Holy Ghost was touching and pricking the heart of Saul of Tarsus. And so there he falls asleep, and he is now the first martyr of the church. He would not be the only martyr. Many others would die. We've already looked at the life of James, and he was a martyr also, but he died actually after this time. He was, according to the book of Acts, would have been the second martyr. Uh, but Stephen, the, the evangelist, Stephen, the deacon, Stephen, the servant, who uh, is just simply being faithful to, to the Lord, dies. His ministry is short, is it not? <clears throat> his ministry was one of, of great impact, though. We might look at his life and say, wow, what a waste. Here's a young man, had his entire life to live. He, he defends the Israelite, uh, you know, he defends uh, Jesus he calls out the Israelites, he's killed. And to some people, they might question, wow, you know, if God is really for him, why did he have to die? But you know that God does everything for a purpose and for a reason. And even in that death, I believe God was preparing the heart of the next great apostle and evangelist, the Apostle Paul. For we know in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them called according to his purpose. And that day, Stephen fulfilled his purpose. His purpose was to preach that day, and his purpose was to die. And who are we to question God's plan for someone's life? Who are we to say he should have lived and should have escaped and should have, should have had many more years of, of ministry? And so he was called to serve. His service was very brief, but very powerful. And his ministry would go on to affect the lives of many others as uh, one of the persons there eventually would get saved and become a great, great evangelist. And so, as we look at this particular story, it just shows us how God works everything out according to His plan, according to His purpose. And so what does that tell us in life? It just tells us that every day we're just to do what God's will is. If God's will means we have to suffer, then we suffer. If God's will means we must give up our life for the gospel, then we give up our life for the gospel. And I know sometimes as we go through life, we... Uh, we want a good life, a nice life. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to be persecuted. And, you know, most of us that live here in the United States will never suffer persecution for our faith as we are protected, protected at least by our, our religious freedoms and liberties. But that's not the case in every nation. And even as we see the, the, the tragedy of what's going on in Afghanistan, how that uh, Christians will die for their faith and uh, how that... Um, because of, of their faith in Christ, uh, they're not only in that country, but in many other countries in which there are radical terrorism going on, there'll be many, and there have been many, that have given up their life. All throughout the history of Christianity, there's been a trail of blood. There have been people who, because of their faith, would give up their life. Unless we think that their life is in vain, we must realize that as he saw Jesus that day, he was welcomed into the arms of Jesus. Jesus, I'm sure, told this, this great man of God, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And no matter what God calls us to do, may we hear those words likewise, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for this time to share the word. I pray, Lord, that the message was a blessing and a help as we looked at a great man of God, a brief ministry, a very short time which he was serving you, but Lord, a very powerful time. A man that was a servant, took care of the people, but yet a man who was bold and courageous, a man of faith, a man who defended the faith, a man who died because of his faith. Lord, teach us and show us how to be bold, how to be courageous, how to stand for our faith. Father, bless now our time together. And uh, I pray, Lord, as we have looked at this story, that it too will touch our heart to realize no matter what happens in life, if we are doing your will, that good will always come from it. So, Father, bless now. and touch our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to thank you for being here tonight, watching us online. Hopefully next week we'll be back in person again. But uh, we pray your bless, uh, that, that God will bless uh, the preaching and teaching of his word. Good night. Stay safe.